This chapter is dedicated, dedicated to all the students who have been wondering, you know, I will never work with jet engine, I will never go supersonic, why I'm taking this course? I shouldn't have taken that course to start with. So now this course is, this chapter is basically telling you, no, don't be sad. This course, this, this course is actually for even air duct. So this is a perfect example of insulated duct with friction. You know, all the air duct in our buildings, basically it's in this chapter, right? So it doesn't have to be supersonic. Even if subsonic, this chapter applies. So what are we trying to calculate over here? If you have an insulated duct with friction and you know the stuff at the inlet condition, Mach number, pressure, the Mach number could be 0.3 or something, or 0.1 or whatever. Huh? And this duct is running all the way from, say, the machine room on the roof down up to here, huh? and all this building, what would be the velocity, the pressure, and the temperature at the end of the of the duct, all right? So there will be a lot of weird, weird thing that will happen in this chapter that will change your physical understanding. So for example, you know, when you think about duct with friction, huh? you think the pressure will drop as we move in the duct or will actually increase as we move with the duct? <coughs> huh? So as I'm moving in the duct, Tommy's saying the pressure will go up. So you think the pressure will go up as I go in the duct? So basically the inlet, huh? It's like in the on the roof and the outlet is here. And during so you are thinking that the pressure Actually, your first answer was correct. So, <laughs> the pressure will actually go up. Imagine this, if the flow is supersonic. So a supersonic flow moving in duct with friction, the pressure will go up. Not subsonic, subsonic will pressure will go down. Now how about the velocity? Duct with friction. Are we subsonic? That's an excellent answer. That's an excellent answer. So let's start with subsonic. A subsonic flow in a duct with friction, okay? The velocity as we are moving in, in the duct from the start at the machine room all the way to the exit over here, will the velocity increase with distance or decrease? Increase. Wow, that's right, it will actually increase. The velocity will increase if the flow is subsonic and it will decrease if the flow is supersonic, right? So some of those things, we will see a chart with all those changes. What happened to the temperature? What happened to the velocity? What happened to the pressure? Some of them will make sense, and some of them will not make sense, because you will tend to forget that this is compressible flow, and the density is not constant. And so all the weird thing that will happen, that, that always the answer is, well, what happened to the density? All right? So for example, because the area is constant, that make because A is constant, that make rho V is constant. So any time the density drop, the velocity has to increase. Friction, no friction, the, the mass flow doesn't care. If you drop my density, the velocity have to increase. And that explains why would the duct with friction basically have a velocity increase in it. To the extent that if it's really long enough, he can go to Mach 1 at the end. So you start from Mach points 1, and if the duct is really long enough, you could hit sonic velocity at the end, all right? And that's, that's a problem because if the duct is like really, really long, the flow will get choked and you will not be able to send the flow at the right flow rate. Well, that's we'll, we will see all those details, all right? But I just have you to keep this in mind that it's all those weird thing happen because the density is changing and that's the answer to our question, all right? So what's our job in this chapter? You will be, on all those problems, basically, you'll be given the condition before the duct start. You will also be given the friction factor F. Where did we get this friction factor when we were taking fluid one? Moody chart. We had the Reynolds number, we had the material. Is it steel, glass, PVC, whatever? And we get that F. And so you know that the F is function of Reynolds number. It was there on the X axis, right? So of course, as the velocity change in the duct, 
we better have different f. No, we will not. We just have constant f. So that's an approximation in this because we want to get the solution by hand. If we are doing this in MATLAB huh, or using numerical method, we can allow the f to change on us. But over here, we will just basically use an average f throughout the duct. All right? But you should know at the back of your head that really the f should change as the velocity basically change because that changed the used number. Okay? So we know the stuff in, we know the friction, we know the lens, uh, 100 meter, 30 meter, and we would like to find out what is the new Mach number, the pressure and temperature at the exit. Okay? And so remember, this is a diabetic duct, insulated duct. There is no heat transfer with the outside. That's different from natural gas pipeline, okay, which will tend to have heat transfer, right? But but the, the HVAC ducts, those are really good example of insulated ducts, right? Because you tend to insulate them because you don't want them to get heated or cooled before they hit the target, which is the room at the second floor where the people are hot and they need cold air, right? So how are we going to get those guys? What are our tools? Continuity, energy, and momentum equation, right? Let's start with only continuity and energy, and then we'll do the momentum in the, after a few slides. Because those two guys by themselves, they give us a lot of physical insight to what will happen, all right? So what's the continuity? Rho EV equal constant. In short, because the area is constant, rho V is constant. Because the area is constant. This is constant area duct. The energy equation, Q minus W, equal basically a change in the total energy, right? So the here is the energy bef after and then is the energy before, or basically the outlet and the inlet. So that's NSLB and kinetic energy. NSLB and, set and kinetic energy. Of course, there was also potential energy, GZ and GZ. Assuming horizontal, they cancel, or even it's vertical, it's air, gas. We don't care about the potential energy that much. It's, it's very little, right? So then you can see that well, with no Q and no work then this must be equal to this, or the total n sol b is the same. The stagnation n sol b is the same. So if h total is constant, that means t total is constant. Or basically, in short, because the duct is adiabatic, t naught throughout the duct is constant. So it's like the shock wave. Remember the shock wave was adiabatic, t naught was constant before and after? Well, same thing here. T naught in this constant duct with friction, although there's friction, but T naught is basically constant. Which mean what? It means that because the kinetic energy and the thermal energy in terms of NSLB, they have to remain constant. Any change in velocity, if the velocity go up, the temperature will have to go down. And if the temperature go up, the velocity will go down. Because at the end of the day, the energy you are carrying is constant. You don't allow anything to escape. Okay? Very good. So, so T total is constant. All right? This is the thermodynamic relation, basically, that we had in the chapter one. And he's trying to figure out what will happen to the entropy. Because you want to plot the TS diagram. It really helped to see how does this flow look like on the TS diagram. You know how I solve, whenever I solve another problem, I always tell you, let's plot the BX diagram. How does the pressure have a change with the distance? In those final flow duct, huh, we always have to plot those TS diagrams so that we can see what happened on the temperature entropy. It helped to understand, right? So he's trying to do this by figuring out what's the relation between the entropy and the temperature. Where you can find this? Well, it's here in this equation. Here is the entropy, and this du is basically CV dt, right? I can cancel this du and write CV t dt, and then integrate. This will give me delta S, and this will give me ln t. The other part is d rho, so it comes ln 
rho over rho and rho because rho v is constant you can take the rho and write the v so that will happen to the entropy in terms of the temperature and the velocity okay he would like to get out of that velocity too so he will replace it from the fact that from the energy equation t total huh, is cbt total or the total enthalpy is h plus v square over 2 or cp t plus v square over 2 so he can take out the v and write instead h total and h or basically t total and t why he's doing all this because he wants a relation just between s and t you just want to see how does the st diagram look for a flow like this okay that's what's going on so he got his equation here is the entropy in terms of the temperature and here how it look like on a ts diagram it, if you plot this you'll end up with that curve okay so point one at the beginning of the duct could be here or here you know it could be anywhere any one of those points could be the starting point depending on what's my temperature and entropy now as i'm going into that flow i'm going with the flow huh adiabatic duct with friction i'm going between one and two where would be point two will it be to the right or to the left for a free homework problem if you tell me to one. the right or to the left then why no point two is the exit so i am starting at point one let's say point one is like this guy so my question is where is point two should it be to my right or to my left to the right. why because enthalpy is always positive you can't go below enthalpy is always entropy entropy is always positive generated entropy is positive it can't it, are you sure it cannot be negative well uh, it can and you said it's, it's something it's don't help him don't look to him i'm just looking at him Okay, so you are about to get a free homework problem if you tell me why in this case that you are right the entropy has to increase Why the entropy has to increase in this problem? It cannot decrease because the entropy can decrease So why no one answer why in this case the entropy has to increase and therefore state 2 is always to the right to state from state 1 for a free homework problem Andrew no. Yes. Undo the frictional forces. Yeah, you can't ever undo friction. Well, Nissen, you are that close. You are half close. You have to answer. You add one more thing. You said because of friction, and you have to add something else that will explain why the entropy has to increase here. Oh, it's friction and. No, I'm not. <laughs> one more chance. Huh? No, there is another keyword if you add to the, it's because the friction and adiabatic. So I, I guess we'll give it to him. So Sean get back his free homework. If the heat transfer is more than the friction, it can actually be. You got it, you got it. Let's, let's put it in. So because it's adiabatic, because the duct is adiabatic, that means the entry can be either zero or increase. Remember, the entropy can decrease if we have heat transfer out of the control volume. The entropy can decrease if you allow the heat to escape. Okay? So the, the heat transfer can increase or decrease the entropy. Depending on are we adding heat, the entropy will go up, or are we taking heat, the entropy will go down. Having the duct insulated, that basically makes us having two choices, zero or increase. Now, with friction, we cannot have the zero. We have to have the extra. We have to have that entropy to increase. So at the end of the day, then point one, if point one is anywhere, point two is always has to go to the right. So if you start here, you're going this way, this way, this way, this way. If you start here, you have to go this way, this way, this way, this way. All right? Once you reach that point, then what? Can you go back this way on the curve? No, right, the, the entropy, that means the entropy is decreasing, it cannot. So this is kind of the terminal point. All those flows will always reach this point and that's the end of the story. <coughs> what is that point? We wanna find this point. If, if you have a curve like this and you wanna get this point, what is that point? You would basically mathematically, you say that point mean dy by dx equals zero. 
here it would mean ds by dt right ds by dt equals zero so i want to get ds by dt equals zero so well here's my s i just have to differentiate this with respect to t and that's the differentiation ln t is one over t ln whatever is this guy and set this equal to zero you get what you get one over t equal to those guys what are those guys that's v square equal t gamma r v square is a square that mean m equal one this point is huh mach one so the duct is rushing toward mach one if it's long enough he will hit mach one supersonic he will from say start with max three you go to three two and then one if you start subsonic point one you will go to point one point two point five point seven one everything is rushing toward one okay so it's either going to this or going this way okay now which one is supersonic and which one is subsonic no the opposite the bottom is supersonic and the top is subsonic how can we tell huh yeah you are are you are you thinking this is an oblique shock wave chart or what why you're saying the top is supersonic why Yeah, it's not right the top is subsonic <coughs> but why did you think it's supersonic of course the right if this was velocity you would think this is yeah. higher than this right but because of temperature that actually mean if it's hotter that's probably have lower velocity than this one this guy have higher velocity for the same this graph is plotted for the same t total right this is for the same t total all those points have the same t total so this guy having higher temperature that means he has lower velocity and this guy having lower velocity lower temperature that means he has higher velocity and as he basically decelerate his temperature increase and this guy, the duct was the subsonic duct was friction. As he going to Mach one and his velocity is increasing, his temperature is actually dropping. Right? So again, the, the natural gas pipeline are not really exactly this because there is a little bit of heat transfer allowed. They are not insulated. But still, this drop in temperature, you will see it. The the power plant in Jinx. They're, they bring the natural gas pipeline from the supplier. And so by the time it go to the, to the furnace, <coughs> we visited there in the middle of the summer in, in my energy conversion class. I take them to the power station to see. The pipeline is so cold in the middle of the summer, it's like there is ice on top of it. And the guy was joking that he said, we put our beers over here to, to get cool. Because it was really cold in the middle of the summer. All right? So again, subsonic, supersonic, and both cases are trying to hit Mach equal one, right? So subsonic is shooted with higher temperature and supersonic is shooted with lower temperature. Again, for the same T total or stagnation temperature, okay? So now what happened if you said this is the terminal state? You know, I'm, I'm rushing all the way until I hit this point. So, and so that take a little, say let's take takes 50 meter and then I will hit this point what if my duct is 55 meter what will happen then I come to Mach 1 and then I just keep Mach 1 but what about the extra friction that I'm having for the next 5 meter those should increase my entropy I cannot st staying at this point mean that I have the same entropy the air gets hotter. but I, I have to leave this point my, I'm trying to explain that I cannot stay here if I stay here for the next five meter after I hit Mach one, that means that I have the same entropy. You change the T-mount? You change the curve, right. You switch to a different curve. So a subsonic flow huh, will be able to see the end of the duct before he go in, or the, basically he doesn't see, the pressure wave travel into him. The pressure wave will tell him this duct is not 50 meter. He will not just get Mach one. This duct is 55 meter. 
there is extra five meter. So what will happen is that you will move to a smaller, Mac, smaller mass flow rate so that you will hit Mach 1 at the end of the 55. So the inlet condition will change so that, of course, on the, on the expense of reduced mass flow rate. Okay, so that duct is not enough, big enough, actually, distance-wise, where the friction is not small enough to let that mass flow rate go. That's choking. So he will end up being choked at the end, all right? And if you make him only longer than the distance, that lens that it takes to choke him, he will actually have to start with a lower velocity. Now, so that, that's what I'm explaining over here. That at that point, the duct will not go into the green line. He will go into, as they the blue line. That's basically a reduced flow rate duct, okay? Now, how about a supersonic flow? What if state one is supersonic? So we have a problem because supersonic flow doesn't really know how long is the duct is before he gets in. He doesn't see it. So what will happen is, I mean, he cannot just go to Mach 1 and then after he go to Mach 1, he realizes, wow, that's really long. Let's uh, do something about it now. So what will happen is that he will go through this thing as supersonic and then at a certain distance, depending on how big this duct is, or just like in the normal shock, remember a normal shock in the nozzle? If I, or can I plot it over here for you? When we had supersonic flow in a converged diversion nozzle, we said that that supersonic flow, if the B-back is big enough, this could actually be inside, huh? And so the question, so the flow will go like this, but then at this point, he will go up and then become subsonic. And so the question is, well, since the flow is blind and he cannot see, how come he managed to see this? Well, eventually, you know, eventually he will have to realize there is a wall that he cannot hit. And so, I mean, he can play blind for, for a long distance, but then depending on how high this wall is, he will need to realize this and basically turn into subsonic, all right? What I'm trying to say is, if you have the supersonic flow leaving this thing, huh? and you lower the back pressure, even to zero, he cannot do anything about it. But if you increase the pressure, or even you put your hand and close the nozzle, he cannot just say, well, I'm supersonic flow, I'm not supposed to see this, I'm going to go through your hand. He cannot go through my hand, right? So if you, if you increase the pressure, he cannot ignore that there is a high pressure in front of him. Okay, he can ignore it for a little bit, and that's the part where he basically stays supersonic, but then he basically has to turn subsonic. And so the higher this wall, the higher that resistance, the earlier the shock will happen. So the same thing over here. The higher this lens in front of, the longer that lens in front of him, the higher the friction, the more the resistance, the earlier that transition will happen. So he will go from supersonic to subsonic on the same duct equation, on the same curve. That's very important for solving a lot of problems later on. It's key to why it's the same duct, why he moved to the same equation, same curve. Because it's the same M dot and the same T note. And those are the two equations that generated this curve. <coughs> that curve was made for the same M dot and the same T note. So, shock or no shock, the duct is still adiabatic. T note is still the same. Shock or no shock, the M dot, the mass flow rate is the same. So he cannot just say, I'm going to go to the blue curve. He has to go also to the green curve. And once he go to the green curve, now he's subsonic, and he will adjust to this lens by basically going subsonic. So the flow will become like this, normal shock, and then so keep going. The red line, but, but you know what? A, a good idea is actually to make it dotted like this because it's kind of a reversible process and we don't really know the pass. So, but he would jump from here to here. Okay, and then after that, keep going. So the lens, 
that it will take to choke the duct or the lens that it will take to reach Mach 1, this is called the star condition. So at Mach 1, the pressure here we will call it, what do you think? B yeah, we'll call it B star. And the Mach number will end up being M equal 1. So the lens that will the reach that state 1 take to hit the star condition is called L max, L max 1. Okay? That's how it will take to go to the star condition. And obviously, this is L max 2. That's how long it takes from state 2 to go to the star condition. And what's the difference between L max 1 and L max 2? It's L, right? So L max 1 is L max 2 plus L. Right? Does this make sense? So what's L max 1? That's the distance it reach. It takes state 1 to go to the start condition. This is how much it takes. And L max 2, that's how much it takes for state 2 to go to start condition. And obviously the difference between them is the length of the pipe itself. You know how you cannot solve an expansion fan equation, an ex expansion fan problem without this equation, huh? the turning equal to nu2 minus nu1? You cannot solve a fan of flow problem without this simple equation. That is the secret to solving all fan of flow problem. But you know, let me just drop an f over d over here. Okay? Doesn't change much, right? What's F? That's the friction factor. What's D? That's the vibe dancer. This is the equation that we will start any final flow problem with. And it's gem simple geometry, right? L max is bigger than L, ma L max 1 is bigger than L max 2 by, by the L, the duct lens. Okay? And so just like the turning equation, he always can give us two things and ask for the third. Same thing over here. He can give us M1. So it turned out that M1 and L max 1 are related to each other, of course, right? Actually, there is an equation that we will drive in a second. And M max, L max 2 and M2 are related. All right? So again, he can give us the length of the duct and the start and he ask for the exit. Or he can give us the inlet and the exit and, s and ask us, well, so how long was this pipe? All right? And switching between L max and M, there's an equation for it that we will drive right now. And it will be in appendix F. Very good. Excellent. So we are now in appendix F. So appendix F will basically tell us, if you know M1, what's the length it takes that M1 to go to the star condition? Okay, and, and then this way we will, we will think about this problem just like as if it was a turning problem. Not it has the same physics, but it has the same solution procedure. You tell me the lens and the, the inlet, I can tell you the exit. Okay, or you tell me the exit and the lens, I can tell you the inlet. Any two of them, I can calculate the cell. Okay, let's see this equation, how they come up with it. So that equation will come up from the Again, we don't have anything but continuity, momentum, and energy equation. We already use the continuity and the energy equation in generating the STS, and that explains a lot to us, you know, how we are all up approaching Mach 1, right? Now we will use the momentum equation to come up with this equation that he will integrate. We are not going to integrate. Maybe they will integrate in numerical in 3013. We'll give it to them as a homework or something. We will not integrate over here. But basically, this is a momentum equation. He has a control volume. He put the forces, P, P plus delta P. And when I say P plus delta P, I don't mean that the pressure will increase. I'm just saying the pressure will change, right? So that dP can be plus or minus. There's friction in terms of shear stress time area, the surface area. And the momentum equation, if you remember, the forces equal to unsteady term. That's not here because this problem is steady equal to m dot out v out minus m dot n v n. And that shear stress, dimensionless 
way of expressing the shear stress is 4 tau over half rho v square. And that f comes from the Moody chart. And so you can then put this f inside here. And this equation becomes this. Okay? Yeah, that's an excellent problem for the final in numerical. You know, we can give them this and tell them integrate using uh, Simpson method. So. Right. So, f dx over d, and basically this is all. So this is function of distance. This is function of m. All right. And so obviously the lens it reach you need for Mach one for Mach to reach Mach one, huh? is basically the result of that integration. And that's what we put in appendix F. So I would like you to open appendix F one more time for me. And let's read what are on the appendix. So what do you see there? Numbers. Yeah, but the <laughs> legend. Tell me the legend. The Mac number, right? T over T star. T over T star. And then, and row. There's row here. Let me let me put the row. So there is row over row star. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right. All right. So those are the column that we have. It's specifically this guy, the F L max over D. That's what we need to solve the problems. All right. How come there is no T naught over T naught star? Because it doesn't change. Very good. So T note throughout the duct, the adiabatic duct to friction is constant. Right? But there is B note over B note star. Because B note is being killed as we are moving in the duct because of all the friction. Right? And so all those star conditions are basically the the pressure, the temperature, huh? The P note at this point. This point could be real, could be imaginary. Meaning that, I mean, the duct could finish here and you never reach the star. But still, we will use it to solve the problem. So the cartoon that I always like to use in those problems is this, that using the condition at one, <coughs> huh, we can always go and get the star, P star and T star and P naught star. And then, knowing them, we will be able to calculate M2 and P2 and T2. Right? How? Well, if you know M1, you can get those values. And since you know T1, you get T star. P1, you get P star. P naught 1, you get P naught star. And then what? And then second step is to use this equation. This equation, if you know M1, and hence you know L max 1, and L, you can get L max 2. If you know L max 2, then you read M2. You go back here, and you figure where is M2. And you get T2 over T star, B2 over B star, P0 2 over B0 star, and you have all the star condition already. We solve for your P1 and T, sorry, P2 and T2 and, you got it? Sure. Let's see and now, uh, we'll see a bunch of examples. Right, but, but see, here is uh, what happened to the flow. All right, so that here's the ground basically told us that if we have subsonic, the Mach number is gonna increase, increase so that you would hit one. And if you have supersonic, the Mach number will decrease until you hit M1. The temperature comes straight from this curve. Subsonic is getting cooled. And remember those guys putting their beer bottles basically on the end of the duct. That's how cold it will get. And the supersonic, the Mach number, the temperature will actually increase. Just straight from the graph. The entropy, of course, it will increase in both cases because of shame. The entropy will increase always because of waste friction, adiabatic waste friction, right? Now, P total, of course, it's getting killed both ways, whether supersonic or subsonic. P total, <coughs> the stagnation pressure is dropping, 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 all right? Now, the velocity. So, obviously, the velocity basically in subsonic, it's increasing, and supersonic is decreasing because of this. If you remember that H total is constant, and therefore, the T and V need to balance each other. The T and V square need to balance each other. So drop in temperature means the velocity increase. Increase in the temperature means the velocity decrease. Now, I guess the weird thing is this, the pressure. So I plotted for you the pressure. 
with X. So subsonic, the pressure will drop. That makes sense. That's what we expect in any flow with friction. You know, there's pressure drop, therefore, we need a compressor to make the flow go through this duct, right? That's why we have the compressor at the back so that the pressure go really high at the inlet so that he will drop, drop, drop. So by the time he reach the, the, the actual exit, he's slightly above atmospheric so that he can actually leave. Supersonic, that's weird. The pressure actually will increase. So how come? I want you to think about those friction elements. They are as if they are kind of compression waves along the way. So you are basically <coughs> compressing the supersonic flow, reducing its Mach number. Huh? It's kind of like, like tiny oblique shock waves, or really tiny Mach waves. But you are basically, not Mach wave, tiny oblique shock wave. So that you are dropping P0, but you are increasing the P. So that's why the supersonic flow, the pressure is building up. Yang, you have a question. So that's a good question. So the question is, if this is only for straight ducts, so are you, if you are talking about that, first of all, let's talk about the cross-section area, if it's circular or rectangle. So we are doing everything for a, a, a circular duct, axiometric duct, but if the duct is rectangular, like the HVAC duct, all you have to do is to come up with the equivalent diameter that you can use this F on. So the equivalent diameter, there's a formula for it. There's a table for it, and it's basically four cross-section area over the width parameter. And that new diameter will represent your rectangular or square duct. Huh? It's basically, here is the, the pipe, the circular pipe, that will have the same friction drop like this guy. Now, if you are talking about curved duct, what happens if the duct curve? Well, that has to do with the curvature of the duct and the diameter of the duct. So if the diameter of the duct is too small compared to the curvature, the curvature is like really kind of take forever to turn, the duct may not really know that there is even rotation or like there is circulation. But if you know you turn 90 degree suddenly on him, that makes the curvature basically like infinity, or you are turning like really, really quickly, that, that creates basically a 2D problem, not 1D problem like what we have. And so you will create different pressure distribution in this, something like this. Does this answer the question? All right. So now the, the problem gets complicated when you add nozzle to the duct, All right? So if we have, say, a conversion nozzle first. So this nozzle is isentropic, OK? So we, we have been, we dealt with this in chapter three. So if you create pressure difference in this nozzle, the pressure will drop, the Mach number will increase, right? And this nozzle, its maximum dream is to hit Mach 1 over here, right? That if the back pressure outside was actually B star or lower, then you can get Mach 1 from those nozzles. Well, with a ductus friction, this nozzle will never hit Mach 1. Why? Because... Because the Mach no this guy will get choked before the nozzle have a chance to hit Mach 1. So let's follow that procedure. So basically saying, let's start with B back equal P node. Obviously no flow. Once you drop the back pressure a little bit, the nozzle expand a little bit. The Mach number is like say 0.1 or something. But then you go into a ductus friction, adiabatic ductus friction, and this M equal 0.1 will become 0 0.15, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, right? So and if the back pressure is low enough, that the flow in this adiabatic duct friction could hit actually hit Mach 1 at the exit. So obviously this will happen before this nozzle have a chance to, to get even to Mach 3, for example. Huh? And so from this point on, this duct is frozen. Once he hit Mach 1, lowering the back pressure cannot really do anything. And so what will happen if you take the back pressure and put it to zero? expansion fan will happen outside. And the duct is frozen as if it was like a conversion diversion nozzle frozen at M exit equals say three, all right? So again, the duct will be choked before 
the nozzle have a chance to get choked. All right, and so the Mach number will basically, once you hit this point, okay, which will not the point, by the way, not point five to eight three p naught. That will be when b back equal. When will this happen? Huh? B star of the duct, not B star of the nozzle, not the 0.5 to 8 of P naught. It's the B star of this, of this duct. Okay, how can I get that? Well, you go to that table and you will read basically P over P star and you'll be able to get it. Okay? You can also get it from here. So, So once we hit that point, huh, point three, basically the M dot is M dot max. And lowering the back pressure more than this will not really change your flow rate, right? So your flow rate is constant. And here basically I'm trying to explain why the duct cannot accelerate more than this. It's the same argument we had in the diversion conversion nozzle, right? Once the exit reach one, you cannot send an expansion fan inside to make him go faster. Because basically the expansion fan is moving at A and the velocity is coming at V. And they are the same, so they will never reach anywhere. All right, so let, let's look at this example. So we are giving P naught and T naught, the F, D, L, and gamma. And he's basically saying find the M dot max and find the back pressure for M dot max. All right. So this is the case exactly like this, right? It's this curve. Okay, let me plot this over here. So here is the converged diversion nozzle and here is the adiabatic duct with friction. We actually, by the way, call it fano duct, okay? Fano duct, and so the pressure drop in the nozzle and then because it's subsonic, still subsonic, you keep dropping until you hit this place. And so over here, we are basically looking for Mach equal one, because he said it's choked, right? So I, I want to know this back pressure curve over here on the exit, because the exit will be B back in this place. So required is B exit and M dot at that piece. So how can I get this P exit? Um, and by the way, we are given this P naught, huh? So, this is so Amanda, answer is let's use appendix F. What she need to say, let's use this equation that you said you cannot solve a problem without it. That's what this appendix is used for. So the appendix by itself it's just providing the link between the Mach number and the L. the L. So we need the equation for the L, right? Which say L1, so if I call this one and this is two, so L1 is L2 plus, plus L, very good. This is L. <coughs> and so actually it happened to be the star over here. But in general, huh? so L, Max one, L max two equal to L. Or basically, let's put F over D over there, F over D, because the chart is for basically F over D. And let's tell ourselves where are the two things that he knows and where is the third thing that we want to calculate, because that's how we're going to get this. So, what's going on? He's choked. So, what is L max two? For a free homework problem. Zero. Excellent. Robert had a zero. Ah, uh, I had a free homework. <laughs> if you tell me why the zero is. <laughs> <laughs> Don't no, speak. you say that. <laughs> yeah. If you tell me why it's zero, you get the free homework. Don't help him. L max two is zero because Yang. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why? 
So because Mac is one at the end, so it would take zero to go there. You're already yeah. there. So Andrew has a free homework. Right. <laughs> so they remind me to give you the free homework. So L max two is zero because Mac two is already one. And if you don't know, you can just open the appendix F and read huh? for L max, F L max over D equals zero, you will see actually one that corresponds to Mac equal one, or the opposite. If you look for M1, you'll find that F L max over D equals zero. Can anyone check, please? You have appendix F open? So for M equal one, the length is zero. Then that make F L max over one equal two, FL over D. Again, this problem, we will be given two things and we will be asked about the cell. So what are we getting? This guy and this guy. What can we get? Lmax one, which means we can get M1, right? And so if I'm giving you M1 over here, Now, from this equation, we can get M1, right? If I have M1 here, how is that helping me to find the stack pressure? If, have one. if I have now M1, okay. we just calculate M1. Again, we want to calculate this pressure, the P2, for a free homework problem. How you can calculate P2? Knowing M1 and B01, or this B0, sorry, it's not P01. Actually, it is B not one, right? Why B not one is the P at the reservoir? Because the nozzle is isotropic, right? So now for a free homework problem, how can I calculate this P two out of M one and B not one? P two over P zero, so P P not one over P zero, P not zero. Say that again. P two over P zero over P one over P zero. B not over B zero. P naught over B throat or B naught one over B one is half ten minutes. What do you mean? Half ten minutes. Half ten minutes. P two over P one. Yeah. Why? P two over P P zero. P one over P one over P zero. No, it doesn't make sense. No. Then get the other one. So. How you can get B2 out of M1 and B01? What is the step to get that? For a free homework problem. Yes, John. So tell me exactly how you're going to use appendix F. Knowing what, get what. No, the pressure too, we don't know. That's what we are trying to find out. We are trying to get this pressure. And what we know is M1 at the beginning of the duct, and what we know is the pressure here, which happens to be also P01. Of course, it's not P02, right? You know that, right? We can use our isotropic flow table to get P1. Correct. So M1 and P01, using appendix P, I can get P1, correct. And then what? So how do you want me to use appendix F? Knowing what, we should get what? What's what's the input to appendix F? Like, how can I find my line in appendix F? There are so many lines. How do you want to use it? Use, uh, this, we know Mach 1. Yes, we, we know Mach 1. Yes, that's Mach correct. On the table of F. Yes, I get B over B star. B1 over B star. And of course, B star is so John and Andrew had free homework So what happened over here is this point is the exit of the nozzle and it's the inlet of the duct. So the pressure here, you can get it from the isentropic flow from the nozzle and you can use it in the final flow duct to get the B star. And it happened that B star is B2. Have 
But then B star is basically outside over here. That's still okay. We would have got this B star and then use it to calculate B2. Good job. We are done.